to welcome to the seminar series in the Gemini Center on Quantum Computing. Today, our speaker is Håkon Fredheim. He's going to talk about the mathematical approach to couple cluster methods. He's uh, currently doing his PhD in the Combined Project at UAO, and I'm very much looking forward to his talk. So without further ado, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Franz. Um, so yeah, that's my title, Mathematical Approach to Couple Cluster Methods. I have some, I have a couple of uh, introductory slides. I will just do that uh, very quickly. So um, this is my name. Um, uh, and these are my supervisors. You all know them, of course. Um, but uh, Simon is my main uh, supervisor. Um, he's uh, here at the Hillero Center, which you might have uh, heard about as well. This is part of uh, um, uh, the Inst Institute for Chemistry here, a uh, big research center, and uh, uh, people here do uh, um, uh, quantum chemistry. And I will uh, talk a little bit about what that is, quantum chemistry. This is the combined project, as you mentioned, Franz. This is a nice photo of all of us. Um, not all of us, in fact. Or is it? I think uh, there have been some new additions, maybe, since this photo was taken. Uh, but as you can see, um, so this is uh, the research, uh, I guess, uh, uh, project that I'm a part of. Uh, yeah. And uh, France is there also um, uh, focusing on on many body physics and the quantum uh, information theory, I guess. All right. So, what do I want to uh, talk about today? Uh, basically, I want to try to explain a little bit about what is quantum chemistry. Uh, I'm guessing that most people here, or many, have a background in physics, uh, by the looks, or mathematics. So, uh, that will make things easier. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, quantum chemistry is, uh, a physicist would just say that this is a uh, a special uh, part of of physics. Um, so, um, uh, a chemist, as you know, mixes different uh, chemicals, uh, and she's very happy doing that. While um, uh, a quantum chemist does the, uh, I guess, uh, calculations uh, on the blackboard here in this case, but. Um, in uh, usually nowadays, uh, this is done using uh, uh, computers, basically simulating uh, uh, all kinds of um, quantum systems that are um, that that are uh, uh, driving the the chemical processes. And so uh, the quantum chemistry is really a, a collection term for, for many different things. Usually it's about uh, computations. So um, based on the principles of quantum mechanics, the quantum chemist wants to simulate, simulate the reactions uh, and uh, calculate reaction rates, calculate energies of molecules. And then um, also, a uh, quantum chemist might do uh, try to calculate thermodynamic properties of gases and solutions and do um, basically do statistical mechanics and um, calculate uh, f phases of matter when uh, that's really when when uh, uh, quantum chemistry and and physics uh, coincide really in, in that those kinds of stuff um so this is really what quantum chemistry is, just a collection of, of different things. But uh, at Hillero Center, we people here usually do, um, uh, I guess, uh, simulations of, of molecules and, and that kind of simulations and calculations. 
So in the usual setting of quantum chemistry, you have a big molecule, and uh, this is uh, this can be described by a wave function. Um, as you learned in quantum mechanics, the wave function describes uh, all the particles in the in the uh, big molecule, and um, we parameterize this wave function by coordinates in three-dimensional space. And you can add uh, the spin here if you want to, or you should. <laughs> and uh, the uh, dynamics is described by the Schrodinger equation, um, which uh, usually is using the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian, uh, which looks like this. Here we have uh, the usual uh, kinetic term with a, a column potential for all of the atomic cores in the molecule. And then we add here uh, the, um, uh, I guess, force between the, the electrons. So this is just a column uh, force here, column potential between the, yeah the electrons so this is the this is the this is a very normal setting but of course there are many uh, other things you can do but uh, for instance if you want to have uh, light uh, interactions with light you have to add some some uh, stuff here in the hamiltonian um uh, but this is a, a normal setting for quantum chemistry now uh when we have such a big Hamiltonian, it's natural to uh, try to find the eigenvalues. Uh, and this is a very popular thing to do. Um, the eigenvalues. Now, this is uh, important. The physicists know that uh, eigenvalues are uh, very important because these are basically the measurables. These are the things you can measure. Uh, and uh, in the case of this uh, big molecule, uh, okay, so let me just say what these uh, images are. On the right-hand side here, this is an illustration of what usually the spectrum of such a Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian looks like. Usually you have some um, a, a number of, of bound states uh, below a certain threshold and then the ground state is, is somewhere around here giving the lowest eigenvalue of the of the Hamiltonian and then you have a, a, a what we call ionization threshold and uh, above that uh, you have a continuous spectrum of this uh, Hamiltonian and the energy from the uh, uh, ground state up to here up to uh, this uh, this value here is, um, I'm guessing that you can see my my uh, pointer. I hope yeah. so. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, um, uh, <laughs> that's the ionization and energy of the, of the molecule. That's the energy it takes to, to knock an electron out of the molecule, basically. And um, how can this, how can we see this spectrum? Well, if you if you record the light emitted by this uh, molecule, you will get something like this, and um, these lines here are uh, all the I guess all the possible distances that you have between all of these uh, lines here. Uh, so you can you plot them in this is a plot of wavelengths. So this particular one is from hydrogen. So um, if you're a good uh, physicist, then you have uh, looked at the hydrogen atom. Uh, this is a very nice result because you can solve it exactly. So um, if we ignore spin, we have uh, the wave function is just a square integral function on, on R3. And the Hamiltonian is, uh, is this one, second derivative and a column potential. Um, now, the eigenvalue equation can be solved analytically. And this is a, this is a very nice uh, 
nice thing. <laughs> um, and it produces uh, this kind of spectrum. It should said, say here one over n squared. Though that's like, um, I guess the distance decreases with uh, n squared and the energies look like this. It should be one over n squared here. Um, and this is the spectrum that you can actually calculate. So uh, maybe you did this uh, back in the day, but um, solving, if you solve the, the hydrogen atom, you get all of these uh, functions out as the eigenfunctions. And these you can list. And uh, uh, they sort of look like this. But what happens if you um, if you have more than one electron, then things become complicated. You're, uh, you have to, first of all, um, let's say you have n electrons. Then first of all, your uh, wave function, it has to be anti-symmetric in all the uh, coordinates. Oh, okay. Uh, this is because we want, um, well, that's uh, that's how the <laughs> that's basically how the electrons uh, work. Um, so we call this the the square integral anti-symmetric uh, functions, which have denoted like this. And uh, for instance, the two electron wave function, you can build one of those from two. Uh, one electron wave functions by making this sort of anti-symmetric combination. And here there is also a slight error on these um, indices, but uh, I guess that you understand what I mean here. Um, so, so there is this, uh, you can define this anti-symmetric product, basically, of functions. This is what uh, is also called Slater determinant. So you can, uh, for instance, the helium atom with two electrons, you can, uh, you can uh, build, uh, you, can tr you can try to solve this. It's not going to be easy for you. Uh, but you can try to build a, a basis for this wave function in the helium atom by combining this basis function uh, that you found for the hydrogen uh, atom uh, with, with these anti-symmetric uh, combinations. So here I just denote the spin uh, with the arrow. arrow. With narrow, yeah. This is a uh, smiling sun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so for n electrons, uh, you have this big anti-symmetric uh, square integral and big anti-symmetric Hilbert space of square integral functions. That's where your wave function lives. And you have this big Hamiltonian. Uh, so people have, of course, been looking at this um, this Hamiltonian for a while, and there are some uh, there are some <laughs> nice nice results about H. So um, first of all, it's clear that uh, that L H is a uh, this H. Now I'm talking about this big, very general Hamiltonian. Uh, H is a self adjoint operator. And it is bounded from below. So that's already, in order for H to be a well-defined uh, physical, describing a physical system, this is always, this is what you need. You need it to be self-adjoint and you need it to be bounded from below or else uh, things are not going to work. Um, and then you have a nice theorem saying that in this, uh, if, in this uh, sum here, if all of these, if the sum of all of these charges is smaller or equal to the number of electrons in my system, i.e. if we have a neutral or positively charged molecule, 
then the spectrum of H looks qualitatively more or less like the hydrogen spectrum in the sense that you have uh, all of these uh, free unbound states up here. And then you have, it's bounded from below by some ground state. And then there are all of these countable number of, of bound states that accumulate to a unique ionization energy. And above that one, there are uh, only free states. So this is a nice uh, result. I tried to find this online, but it's only in in Russian. So it, uh, it's probably not not important for what you say, but electrons are negative. So if negatively charged, so if n is bigger than sum of z, the thing is negatively charged, right? Let's see. Uh, so yeah, so it should be opposite here, really. Um, ah, okay. Yeah. It should be opposite. If if you have less electrons than the okay. charge of the molecule, that's what I meant. I see. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so yeah, because that makes sense also. If you have, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good that you pointed that out. Uh, uh, all right. So um, yeah, so so that's the a good theorem by by this guy Schislin. and um, there are still like there are still some open problems here. People have not figured out certain things. I I took this from a book. Is the ground state unique? Now this is not a very precise question, but um, we know that there there exists a ground state, but exactly when or how to characterize uniqueness of this is not clear. And now there is also a famous uh, thing uh, which uh, is called the ionization conjecture, which is basically the opposite question of this one. Now, here, you, Jeroen, you already said that, um, well, this, this inequality here is the wrong way around. Uh, but um, yeah, so remind. <laughs> so um, the I guess the opposite question is: When can I ne negatively charge my molecule? Or uh, even if you have just an atom, when can you uh, give the? When can the atom hold an extra electron? When can you have negative ions? Uh, and is there a bound? Like if you have a big atom with a huge positive charge, can it in fact hold arbitrarily many electrons? This is a, an answered uh, problem, uh, which is uh, difficult. That's why no one has done it yet. Um, but there is a conjecture about this, which is um, quite nice. Now, uh, I will briefly uh, mention the the sort of mathematical uh, tool tools that we use. Um, uh, yeah, so so this uh, if H is in is a Hilbert space, H is a Hilbert space of general fermionic systems. If H is a Hilbert space, then we can introduce the uh, anti-symmetric tensor product. So this then, so H here, uh, we should understand as, as describing uh, the space in which one particle lives. And then uh, the space of all of these anti-symmetric space, which is spanned by all of these anti-symmetric functions is sort of the uh, space of, where um, two uh, particles live. So we can, uh, there is a natural generalization of this anti-symmetric product to an n-fold anti-symmetric product, which um, looks like this. Uh, I hope it's clear what, what the symbols mean. Uh, tell me if, if they aren't. These are, these are permutations here, sigma. 
And uh, and we can define the n-fold anti-symmetric product of over Hilbert space as the span of such uh, anti-symmetric products. Um, and then it should be um, uh, completed in some, some norm. And the Fox space is, is the sum of these. Uh, so that's where the action happens in in quantum chemistry or in general systems. You 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 can do um, analysis on this uh, anti-symmetric uh, Fox space. Now uh, I will briefly mention uh, this was not <laughs> okay. Um, hopefully this makes sense. Uh, Let's see. Uh, so this this is anti-symmetric product of wave functions, basically. Now you can do a similar thing with operators. You can, if I have an operator on my n particle space here, and another operator on my on an m particle space, I can define an operator on the n plus m particle space. This is just a similar construction uh, where you permute all of the indices and you take a tensor product of these operators. And so we can define if we have an operator A, which acts on the n particle space, then we can define an operator on n plus m space by doing this anti-symmetric tensor product with the identity. And this is what uh, is called in the context of many particle theory. Uh, it's called uh, second quantization. So in usually, or in the easiest case, this A is the Hamiltonian on one particle space. And then you can lift it to, I guess, uh, let's see, N. Well, in that case, n would be one, and then you can lift it to m plus one particle space by doing this and this symmetric tensor product, and you can lift it to all of Fox space by doing this sort of direct sum. And um, the thing about this uh, special symmetric product here is that it works. Um, what's it called? Associativity associatively associatively which means that i can i can define my the second quantization of an operator in in this sort of recursive way and this uh, and this is very useful so now i actually wanted to show some ideas about results using this fact uh, that we sort of uh, have been working on lately However, I did not. Uh, <laughs> I did not uh, have time to complete that, and also I'm running out of time anyway. So, <laughs> but this is just a, a, an idea that I wanted to mention at the end. So I guess this is the this concludes the talk. I guess. Thank you very much. This was a very good introduction. Are there any questions uh, from Hakon for Hakon? Your title said something about coupled cluster. Where? Oh yeah, uh, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get that far. I'm afraid okay. this is just a, this is just a, um, uh, yeah. It's a it's a particular method of of uh, of doing this uh, mm -hmm. solving this uh, eigenvalue problem, uh, but it it falls into this 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 framework here, uh, but yeah. I don't. I. I. It wasn't uh, easy to make an introduction to this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So could you m mention a few uh, things that you're working on? Which direction you're working on? Which basic question you're trying to solve at the moment? All right. Uh, so I wanted to mention this. Uh, here, you see this. Um, all. Of, these, these theorems and all of these questions here, um, they are uh, 
like very difficult questions and people, very smart people have been thinking about this. But uh, what we found out uh, recently, or we think <laughs> we think we found out maybe, was that this, so this first question, whether H is self-adjoint. Uh, so H here can be understood as a second quantization of a what I call the one particle operator and a two particle operator. And so it turns out that you can use something which is called uh, a KLNM theorem to to prove that that this one is self adjoint and bounded from below. And basically, it uses um, well, it relates these two operators to each other. Now we found a nice way of of showing that if you have if you do the second quantization, then you can show using this recursive relation that I mentioned. Um, how should I describe this? <laughs> uh, well, it can be used to basically show this, this first fact, uh, Cato's theorem. And then the question is basically, um, uh, can you use it for the other things? Maybe. You have to okay. check. <laughs> so that's the idea. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. So if there are no further questions, thank you one more time. Um, that's a very nice presentation. Thank you. All right. Thanks.